Good afternoon once again, everyone. This is the Digital World Session. Welcome to everyone who has just arrived. Um, uh, by virtue of the fact that the next speaker is my boss, he will, of course, have all the time he wants to <laughs> deliver this talk. Uh, so um, uh, buckle up. And uh, we'll be taking a break from, or I guess striding a line between physical reality and augmented reality without the use of special substances during this talk. So I'd like to introduce Peter Dermanuelian from Harvard University, who is speaking on fabricating the Giza dream stela of Tutmosa IV in both physical and augmented reality. Peter. Thank you, boy. Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, this topic takes us back to the age 100 years ago of plaster casts, the academic use of plaster casts as teaching and research tools. You remember when all the great museums of the world used to buy and exhibit these? Maybe you don't remember, actually, when they filled many of the, uh, the great collections all over the world. Now they're a hot topic again. They've come full circle, come around, they're being used. And in fact, the logical extension, of course, is 3D scanning and 3D printing. Some of the plaster cast making factories, if that's the right world, are still around. This is one in Brussels, another one in Berlin, the Gips Formerei, for example. So that's a bit of the background context for this odd experiment that we undertook. But my story about the Giza Dream Stealer really begins actually in Mesopotamia. So we've been revitalizing our galleries there. And my curator, Adam Asia, has come up with a way to create lightweight resin, modern resin casts from the old, heavy, flaky, fragile, unexhibitable plaster casts of 100 years ago. And he did this by starting out with our collection of Assyrian palace reliefs. Here you see one of our revamped galleries now with all of these reliefs in place. These were done with student work, with student help, and I must add, for course credit as well. <laughs> and in fact, the process was so successful that being Egyptologically biased as I am, I obviously wanted to apply it to something Egyptian. And so the opportunity finally presented itself recently with the Giza Dream Stela of the Moses IV. Here you see it first cleared 1817 during the Kabylia excavations. And this is uh, Henry Salt's drawing housed in the British Museum. Later, Lepsius's team came to Giza and worked in the early part of 1843. And from the translated letters of Lepsius, you can see the passages here on January 2nd, 1843. He says he had a plaster cast taken of the Dream Stela. And he also had a drawing made, which is great, because often he was sort of taking notes and sketches and then going back to Berlin and trying to do a finalized drawing, which is not the greatest way to do epigraphy. But here you see the drawing as it was published in the date mailer. Well, that plaster mold, that cast, went home to Berlin and ended up in 14 different pieces. And you see it here on the Berlin website. And that was a problem, of course. There were some areas that were not in, uh, in great shape. And several orders were made for the stela. There is one in San Jose, there's one in Brussels, one in Leuven, and I'm sure there were others, maybe in the Cairo Museum basement somewhere. If you know of any, I would be delighted to know. Please come up and see me. But here are some of the problems. For example, the central strip right down the middle, the uh, throne of uh, Geb has suffered a little bit, and then also the right-hand sphinx has had some problems. There's a big hole right there in the right-hand circle. The paw doesn't extend all the way to the edge of the platform the way it should. And in fact, the whole angle of the front of the breast of the Sphinx, you can see those red lines showing all the differences between the original Alepsius drawing and the cast. Well, how to take care of this and how to deal with this piece? We were very lucky to find at the Catholic University in Leuven, one of the casts of the uh, Stila, not in the greatest shape, as you can see here. But my colleague, Marlene de Meyer, jumped on board with this bizarre experiment, and I have to thank her for graciously stepping in and making this possible. It just wouldn't have happened without her and her colleagues. So my curator, Adam Asia, went last summer over to Leuven. We took down the pieces of the stela that were there at the university. And he started the process of fabricating a new <coughs> lightweight resin cast using his process. Here they are cleaning up the original old Leuven version, slathering it with this blue silicone goo to make the mold finishing up the process. You can see how it covers the original completely. And then we get this wonderful rubbery mold. That's the top half. There are two pieces. And then the next step is pouring the resin into the mold. And finally, we get the finished product here. So this is a, a final copy that was left in Leuven. They're going to deal with that and put it back on view and be able to use it. And they got a lot of great press. So if you want to work on your Dutch, just look at the university papers from last, uh, last summer. They came out quite well. 
The next step was to roll this thing up, mummification style, and try to get it back to Cambridge somehow. And that's what happened, more or less in one piece, a couple of rips and tears here and there. But you see it in the lower right, the two pieces down in the uh, Semitic Museum storage. Well, here we thought, can we go one better? Can we get to the next level of this type of fabrication? Meaning, how can we replicate the original look of the pink granite? And so we started playing with pigmenting or colorizing the clear resin to try to replicate this look. So here are some of the samples, mixing pinks and blacks and reds and trying to get uh, a color that would match the original out at Giza itself. And I think we came up with a pretty good solution. So rather than later having to take a beige uh, reproduction of the stila and dabble it with different colors and try to paint it and go over and over again, here's what we came up with. It was mixing different types of colored pigmented resins and slathering it into the, uh, the molds right here. We did this as a sort of public archaeology experiment right up in our galleries that were then undergoing renovation, again with student help, for which I thank many classes that contributed to this. <coughs> so there's the pink component, then the whitish component had to be added too, and you can see dabbling it into the areas and trying to fill all the little spaces. <coughs> and then finally, the black color fills in too, creating a totally unpalatable goo, soupy <laughs> mess here that looks very uh, undis undigestible. So, mulacheya, eat your heart out. This is nowhere near as delicious. And then finally, to back it up, because this was not a very thick uh, layer, we added the regular resin on top of it just to, to give it some strength and, and reinforce it. So that needs to cure for a while. And then finally, peeling off the mold like this produces presto changeo, an instant pink granite looking stila of the Mosa the Fourth. So you can actually make many of these. Uh, I think the mold would deteriorate over time, so it's not a limitless opportunity. But you can see it uh, gets carried off over into the corner. We'd roll it up, put it away in storage, and then get going on the lower half of the text. And you'll see when uh, Adam comes back around and eventually lifts the thing up, that's another advantage, by the way, those big, heavy, flaky, 100-year-old plaster casts you can't just pick up and carry around. But he can do this, and uh, it's <laughs> no, it doesn't work out to, as far as I know, but you can just lift the whole thing up, and you can see with the lighting a little bit overexposed here, but you can see the contrast is there and it looks pretty good. And in fact, a comparison at the top with the actual ancient stila out at Giza and our piece uh, looks like a pretty good match. In fact, it's really just the, the lighting conditions, I think, between these two photos that make them look as different as they are. These are some details not of the original ancient stila, but of our resin cast. And I think you can see it's pretty convincing. We have repaired the paw of the sphinx, so it extends all the way to the edge of the platform that it's on. You can see the date below, year one of the Mose of the Fourth, and also all the details of the face of the king are there. So all of that is done. The next thing is instantly just carry it in and put a few cleats on the wall and put it right up on display. That's another advantage to making these things new and light <coughs> and reproducible over the old and flaky uh, versions, which you know have display holes in them and they're discolored and they're dirty and uh, a little bit difficult to, uh, to produce. So that is the lower half with the inscription. And then you'll see they will uh, pick up the, uh, the lunette and the upper half and put that in place as well. So very easy to do. And it becomes a museum exhibitable tool. It's a teaching tool. It's a research tool. And I'll get to that in uh, just a moment. There's part two, keeping it right on. So we've gone from 14 pieces in Berlin with a lot of problems in the way they join down to just two. It's a pretty nice uh, improvement, I think. For research purposes, this gave us a chance to really have a close look at the stila, which is tough to do at Giza, A, because it's not an area that the public is allowed in. And also, the stila is very, very tall, and it's tough to get up face to face with some of the details. Also, you might notice that Lepsius never made a cast of the lower third. So we've really only done the upper two thirds where the text is preserved, the text in the seams. There is no text down below, and so he ignored it. So we were able to look at some of the features here, and I was quite struck by how deeply carved some of the signs are up at the top. And I know it's quite obvious that large-scale figures and, and uh, important scenes might tend to go uh, deeper and have a bit more detail than the horizontal lines of the text down below. But nevertheless, I was quite taken by that central strip, for example, where the, the carving was extremely deep and the figures were deep. And it made me wonder about possible reuse or recarving or flaws in the original granite block. This was brought down probably from Khafre's Pyramid Temple down to the Sphinx by um, the Mose of the Fourth when he was doing all of his renovations. The other advantage it gave us was a chance to do a kind of conservation, preservation inventory and storage knowledge about this piece. 
So by that I mean looking at the changes over time. So here you can see the original 1817 drawing from the Cabilia era, the Henry Salt drawings. And then in these two lines, everything below the lower jagged line there is what was lost between 1817, between Cabilia, and 1843, when Lepsius was there. And then everything uh, in between was lost between that time and today. So what do we have today? That, everything below the line is gone, also a central part in the center, just at the bottom of the lunette there. And unfortunately, this includes much of the passage where the Sphinx is actually asking the young prince to dig all the sand out. Many of us would think that's the coolest and most important part of the entire text. So by taking a close look at these things, when you have to fabricate a reproduction that can actually bring you some new information, bring you up to speed on the condition, and maybe help with preservation and, and at least inventory. So now we had an analog reproduction of the stela, and it was time to see what digital applications we might use to enhance our work, both for teaching and for research. And one issue, of course, was trying to make the text more accessible. How can we break it out or parse it out and allow people to study it, to read it, to translate it, to understand it? Another was getting them access to the entire area in general. And as I mentioned, the public is not really allowed there. So here I must thank my session chair for being a willy, will, willing a guinea pig to look around. And you'll notice he's standing right between the paws of the Sphinx. He'll turn around and fire right up at the top of the head there. And look at that. You can actually jump to the top of the Sphinx. <laughs> Don't plummet to your death, Nick, there. It's a, it's a unique perspective. The challenge here, of course, in a museum gallery is all of that expensive equipment. How are you going to have someone on hand to show people how it works? Are you going to tether it to the wall? What are the, uh, the display challenges here? And that's kind of hard. So we thought, let's reduce the option and try to bring it back to devices that everyone has, phones and tablets and things like that. So the first step in this is to map out the area. The, uh, gallery space itself in 3D to get the X, Y, and Z coordinates there. Why to do this? This is so that you pull the phone out of your pocket and it knows where you are, it knows what it's looking at, and knows what to show. And so we developed an app to go along with this, and I hope to have it ready today. It'll take another week or two, I think, to release on uh, iOS and Android um, phones and tablets, but here it is. We had uh, the undergraduates in the room acting as beta testers. I know it looks like they're all just texting, but actually they're <laughs> aiming their phones at the stela and at a target on the floor as we tested three different features that we thought this, um, this uh, app might be able to bring us in contact with. So here's number one. You get an augmented reality superposition of the drawing right on to the uh, stela. You can click on any of those little round hieroglyphs to get basic information, such as what's the Sphinx, what's the stela all about. And then down below are two big round buttons. The one at the lower right, the scribal hieroglyph, actually gives you the translations superimposed line by line. So I'm just hitting the next button in the lower right, that orange round button, and clicking through the lunette and then eventually to the horizontal lines of the text proper. You can scroll up and down. Theoretically, you could put this in any languages you wanted to for different visitors. And you can move up close, you can back away a little bit. So a way of parsing the stela where the stela itself becomes the QR code or the target that the phone is smart enough to know about. It knows what it's looking at, it knows the position of each of those things <coughs> and moves on. The other thing you can do is take a look at the lower left, the Sphinx button, and that will bring you right to the site itself. So this time you're standing between the paws. It's the old kingdom, so there ain't no Sphinx stela. Move the slider at the bottom and you're in the new kingdom and the theoretical statue has joined in as well. You can look around in 360 or hit the slider one more time and come to the present day. So people looking like fools in the gallery holding their phone up and moving around in 360 can get a sense of what it's like to stand between the front legs and the paws of the Sphinx. Obviously we haven't built every single wall and every brick to scale. I do thank colleagues in Vienna for the LIDAR data that helped us create this model, but I think it gives a sense of being present at the site. So those are two of the features. And then the third one is a floor target, where if you walk into the gallery, load up the app, that's what it looks like, you'll notice there's a I'm at home or I'm in the museum feature. Aim at the target and up pops the Sphinx one more time, and you can sort of play God and hover around it and get a sense of the structure of it. And again, moving the time slider, so you can see it in the Old Kingdom, the New Kingdom, and get down close. As long as you keep your phone aimed at that round orange target, it won't disappear on you. And then again, slide it and see what it looks like uh, today as well. 
So it gives a good sense of uh, the overall perspective of, uh, of it. And our theoretical reconstruction, as you can see, adds paint at certain times over the whole body or just over the head. That's all up for debate. Uh, one possible interpretation. I'm sure there are many others. So once you do all of this stuff, it actually gets quite confusing sometimes. And you wonder what's really there and what's not, what is reality and what isn't. Things do get confusing. Who can see what, for example? <laughs> I do think cats have superpowers, and here is the proof right here. And I won't dwell on the fact that I was actually trying to make some demos of all of this for this talk, and I turned on my iPhone camera and started filming, when of course I realized that the Sphinx is not really there, and I was making a video of the empty floor. <laughs> so this is just a, a first experiment in these kinds of VR and AR applications for teaching, for study, for conservation, for inventory. Uh, obviously, we haven't added every last detail. One thing we could do is move from the 18th dynasty into the 19th, add the two uh, rectangular Ramses II stele that are on either side of the dream, the dream stele itself. Uh, these are in the Louvre today. We could continue and build the rest of the walls of the little chapel. There's another Cavillia drawing or Salt, Henry Salt drawing in the lower right there, the one on the left from National Geographic. Lots of options you could do, enclosure walls of most of the fourth, the whole bit. And I would suggest that this piece is now a viable antiquity, quote unquote, for all kinds of further applications, whether it's RTI photography, this is not the dream stealer, it's a different one that we did recently, and digital epigraphy from there. Taking care, of course, to note the areas where we had to do some modern repairs to fill in some of those Berlin problem pieces and fix the whole thing up. Can this expand to a sort of form of edutourism, so both in museum applications and also <coughs> on site? I think there are some good possibilities here and maybe some new definitions of the form of publishing in all of its manifestations. And I hope that we can take this a little bit further than something like Assassin's Creed, which nevertheless has made a good faith effort to reproduce this area with the statue and the stele intact in later periods, even though the entire, pers the, the entire scale of the Sphinx is too small in their, uh, in their model. So if you're interested in more documentation about the Sphinx, I'll just put in a plug for ERA and Open Context. That's on the cover of your Scribe magazine that was in all of your packets. There are more than about 6,000 documents online now if you want to get a closer look of mapping every stone and early drawings from uh, ERA's work at the Sphinx area. And all of this ties into our ongoing efforts at the Giza Project at Harvard to make the Giza necropolis more accessible with as much archaeological material, both traditional and 3D and immersive approaches, and with as many different access points as possible. So we're aiming at the experts, we're aiming at the amateurs, we're aiming at the people who want what's cool, what are the top 10 things, to people who are dis doing dissertations on particular tomb scenes, et cetera. So this is our prototype, our new Harvard website. It's growing all the time, has twice as much material as the old Giza website does, and more of these 3D models and immersive technologies will be coming in all the time. We plan to launch the Dream Stila app, I hope, in the next week or two. It will be uh, without discrimination, both for Apple and Android devices, and should be free. Look for it. Look for that orange icon there. And uh, I just want to acknowledge all of our partners, and in particular, Marlene de Meyer, Adam Asia at the Harvard Semitic Museum, and the Vienna Institute for Archaeological Science for providing the LIDAR data that allowed us to build that uh, augmented reality model. As the previous speaker noted about collaboration and speaking the same language, you can see here that an awful lot of labor and effort and collaboration and different skill sets go into building these kinds of things. They can always be improved. This is a first step, and we hope to expand on it. Thanks very much. Not a single sign came up, so I was OK. You were fine. Good. <laughs> So I actually have uh, two, two questions. One is for the, the first one is um, for the app that you guys are producing, is it compatible with, say, an at home VR headset, such as? Compatible uh, with, with what? Um, so, like, with your phone, you can plug into like, an at home VR headset, so something that just plug my phone into. Will it operate like that, or do I have to? Uh, at the moment, we don't have a sort of stereo option, but we could certainly get all this into Unity and make that, that possible. So people, okay. people, time, and money, absolutely. <laughs> okay, but, um, the second question is, um, using these resin casts, I mean, they look amazing. 
Is there anything to say for possibly using any kind of like high definition 3D scan to scale down the scale and 3D printing? Absolutely. Yeah, photogrammetry, all kinds of uh, new operations. We have a a tremendous phase one camera that I'm hoping to use pretty soon. We hope to do RTI photography on all of this, and sky's the limit now that we have this piece uh, without Plexi, you know, in an area that we can access and uh, and do it at our leisure. So that gives us a tremendous leg up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nick is getting his exercise this morning. Okay. Right. Mm, sustainability question. I live, breathe, dream, and have nightmares about sustainability. <laughs> so the Giza project for all of these years is basically trying to create a permanent repository using technology that's designed to be, to be obsolete every six months or so. So it is a huge challenge and a huge problem, and it requires human capacity and sustained input. So absolutely, this will be good for a while, and something else and better will come along, and we'll have to replace it. And as long as there are humans on the case who care about this stuff, hopefully we have the funds to do that. So excellent question. <laughs>